Hello to my nine subscribers. It is me again. It's been a while, a couple of years actually, but I have some more free time now. <clears throat> and I got some new material that I'm going to be talking to you guys about. So when I originally set up the plan, uh, this YouTube channel, I wanted to cover almost all of the courses that I studied uh, throughout my chemical engineer engineering curriculum. And now that I, again, have a little bit more time, I'm going to do exactly that. And for the first series that I'm going to complete, it is going to be about corrosion. After that, we'll uh, reevaluate and see where we go. Uh, but then I'll, I'll provide you with like a flow sheet that you could follow that will allow you to progress from beginner to intermediate and then full on advanced concepts that you'll be applying in your courses or in the real world or whatever you use this for. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. This is going to be lecture one. What is corrosion? Let's define corrosion with a technical definition. Corrosion is the degradation of a metal by a redox reaction with the environment attendant to the formation of a cation that leads to the loss of engineering function. So let's go ahead and write that down. Okay, so what influences corrosion? That would be temperature. That is, as temperature goes up, corrosion rate goes up. And we'll discuss that in later lectures. But for now, just keep that in mind. It is influenced by your temperature. What are cations? Cations are the metals that oxidize. And why do metals oxidize? That is because they are electropositive. Now, what does it mean by a redox reaction? Basically, when you have oxidation, that's when you lose electrons. Metals corrode because they're electropositive, so they lose electrons because they have um, electrons in the outer valence shell that they're ready to exchange with whatever reaction is happening. Now reduction is when you take electrons or accept electrons. And we'll get into more details as to what that means in a bit. But for now, we're just defining some of the terminology that we see here. So let me go ahead and put that here as well. Now, where does oxidation and reduction happen? That happens on the metal surface. It's important to note that electrons do not and cannot transfer uh, via water. Now, assuming that you have your corrosion system is an aqueous one, which is what our focus is going to be for the next, I would say, maybe 10 to 15 lectures, uh, we're going to focus on aqueous uh aqueous corrosion so because we're going to assume that we have a metal in a water solution and we'll we'll go into a, a more deeper example in a bit or the next video just keep in mind that those electrons are not transferring via the water it'll only happen on the metal surface so let's go ahead and write that down now because it happens on the metal surface two things happen. Your anode and your cathodes almost immediately form. And on your anode, that's where you have oxidation taking place. Again, the loss of electrons. And the cathode is where you have reduction taking pl place. That is, it's accepting those electrons, or you could say it's taking those electrons. So let's go ahead and write down those, those definitions as well. So here, because oxidation is happening on the anode, you're losing electrons. 
because you're losing electrons, you're creating a positive state. That, meaning that site on that metal is positive because, again, it has no electrons. So let's go ahead and write the positive. And then we'll uh, write the association of oxidation. And then I'll write loss of electrons. Now with cathode, because it's accepting electrons, that is, it's accepting negative charges, you're creating a negative uh, charge site on the metal surface, so we'll associate it with a negative sign. And then we'll put reduction. And then we'll write collects electrons. Now, sometimes the cathode is called uh, the oxidizer. So let's uh, write this as oxidizer. Or whatever is uh, reducing uh, is known as, uh, whatever is reducing is, is called the oxidizer. So just keep that in mind. Sometimes I might use, oh, what is the oxidizer or reduction is taking place it's they're analogous to each other but I'll go I'll give some examples of that in a bit now some additional terminology that we got to define before we proceed with the next sections is the metal will be called your corrosion cell so let's go ahead and write that now And as I mentioned before, there are cathode and anode sites on the surface of your metal. Uh, these are also called sites. So let's write sites here. And your anodes and your cathodes are always going to be adjacent to each other. Okay, and now let's talk about, um, very briefly, just as a brief overview, uh, metals um, having grains uh, with different sizes. So if you take any material courses, um, and if I ever make any videos on it, you'll learn that uh, metals have different, uh, what's called grains, and some sites are more reactant than others depending on their orientation. And the way you manipulate these grains is you heat the metal to its boiling point and then you cool it down and that usually creates more grains. So the more reactive the grain, uh, the, that would be your anode. And of course, any adjacent grains to your anode would be your cathode. Um, we're not going to be using that concept as much uh, in these lectures, but it is something to keep in mind that uh, grains does influence the corrosion rate as well. Now, we're going to write uh, a couple of things. Uh, we're going to learn about how to write redox reactions using something called your EMF table. And I went on Google and I just pulled up a generic EMF table. Uh, what you learn here should apply to almost any that you encounter. Uh, but I'll use this one for example. And I apologize, it's a little blurry. It's the best example I could find. But here it is. So you'll notice that these reactions, I'll, I'll just start with the one on top. It is written like as so. AU3 plus plus three electrons gives you AU. And then your value associated, associated to that is positive 1.420. This format where the electrons are on the left side, 
this is written as your reduction format because it is accepting electrons so um, you get your final product on the right side now another format that it's written is as follows you'll have AU and then you have AU 3 plus plus 3 electrons but if you rewrite it to have the electrons on the left on the right hand side you'll have to flip your sign. Uh, so right now, it's positive 1.420 if you have your electrons on the left side. If you want it on the right side, it'll be negative 1.420, okay? So <clears throat> this is very important because as you solve some of these problems in the next videos, you might need to flip the reaction. And if you flip the reaction, you'll need to flip that value. Now, in some of these tables, you'll find that the electrons are on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side. It depends. It's just a, you know, it depends on what, which part of the country you're at or which country. Um, but the concept remains the same. You, you have it on the right side, you have it on the left side. Just flip the signs if you got to flip them. Um, and now that I mention this, it's also worthy to note that silver, gold, and platinum do not oxidize in water. So there's other conditions where um, you might introduce that, but not in aqueous corrosion, so we won't worry about it here. Now, what if you have an alloy? When should you consider a particular component in an alloy for your corrosion system? Which, by the way, so we have our corrosion cell, which we define to be our metal, right? But above that, we have our corrosion system. And then there's two components to this. On the left-hand side, you have your corrosion cell. which of course is your metal. And on the right hand side is your environment. So going back to my question, let's say we have a particular alloy, right? And it has two metals. It doesn't matter what metals, but it has two metals. Let's say uh, the alloy is 98% of metal 1 and 2% of metal 2. We would not consider metal 2 as part of our corrosion system because it's not, it's not significant enough uh, for our purposes anyways. So the requirement would be if it's present in quantities of 3% or larger, consider it for your corrosion cell. Now for your environment, there are a few things you want to consider. You have water. And then sometimes it'll say uh, a saline solution or there's salt or seawater or whatever it is. So you'll write salt, NaCl. And then I believe it's potassium sulfate. Sometimes it'll mention, oh, you have potassium sulfate in your solution. So you'll write that as well, K2SO4. But you want to break down a reaction. So the way you would do that, of course, is you write H plus for H2O. NaCl, uh, you write Na plus, plus Cl minus. And then your last one here would be SO4, 2 minus, plus 2K plus. Now, this is a very brief introduction to your corrosion system. I'm going to get into much more deep, deta uh, deeper detail in the next video. 
Uh, but for now, uh, just keep in mind that you have your corrosion system, your corrosion cell, your environment. On the left-hand side goes your metal. It has to be 3% uh, or higher as part of the alloy to be considered uh, part of your corrosion cell. And on the right side is your aqueous environment. You have your water. Maybe it's a uh, salt water. Maybe there's something else in your water. It's not your metal. It goes on the right-hand side. And then finally, we're going to consider... Uh, an equation here and that equation is called free energy of the system and that is defined as delta G equals negative N times F times E Sys or system where E sys or E system is equal to E anodic plus E cathodic, where F is Faraday's constant. And N is the number of electrons. Now, your Faraday's constant is usually 96,500. And your units, of course, will depend on uh, whatever your system is set up as. I believe with this is amperes per second or coulombs. I'll have to double check, but I'll verify with you guys next time. Um, but the constant is 96,500. And once you have all of these values, which of course we have like none of this yet, right? I'm just introducing the equation that you'll be using in the future. Um, but once we find these values, we'll get our delta G. And what our delta G tells us is if, if it's a negative number, we'll most likely have corrosion, very, very likely. Now, if it's a positive delta G, we're usually safe and chances of corrosion are very, very unlikely. But you could never say it's an absolute fact because you'll, you know, additional testing is always recommended. So let's go ahead and write that down. So now uh, we've defined a lot of new equations, a lot of new concepts. Uh, in the next coming videos, we'll start applying it and it'll make more sense as we start conducting our analysis uh, on a corrosion system. So let's go ahead to the top and uh, review very quickly what we talked about. So we said, oops, what is corrosion? Corrosion is the degradation of metal by a redox reaction with the environment attendant to the formation of cation that leads to the loss of engineering function. Now, what are cations? Cations are metals that oxidize, uh, and they oxidize because they are electropositive. Corrosion is influenced by temperature. Usually, when you're, you have a higher temperature, your corrosion rate goes up, so you always got to take that into account. Um, when you do some of your analysis for your corrosion system. Remember, oxidation is where you lose electrons and reduction is where you accept electrons or the thing that's taking the electrons. Two sites are usually created on your metal surface, your anode and your cathode, which are usually adjacent to each other. Now, grains come into the picture. If you take some more advanced material courses, you'll see how they influence uh, how reactive these grains could be. The more reactive grain is usually your anode, and of course, adjacent to that is your cathode. And I've mentioned the definition that reduction collects electrons, oxidation loses electrons. You will define your metal as the corrosion cell. And if it's an alloy and you have one metal component that's 
makes up less than 3% of the total composition, you'll, you, you won't take into account. For our purposes, we'll, we'll be ignoring it. Now, if it, it takes up more than 3% of the composition, then you will take it into account. And your corrosion cell is part of your corrosion system. And then on the right-hand side, you have your environment. And usually, that's where you put the stuff that's in the water. Because again, we're studying aqueous corrosion. So you have your H2O, and you dissociate that equation. And you have hydrogen plus, plus OH minus. Uh, you have, if it's salt water, you add your uh, NaCl, and it goes into Na plus, plus Cl minus. And in the next lecture, I'll explain why that doesn't react, or why it doesn't uh, take part of the reaction. And then, of course, if you have other stuff, K2SO4, it breaks down to SO4 2 minus plus 2K plus. I don't, I don't say the element name. I just read, out, read it the way it is. Now, in this uh, series, we'll be using the standard EMF series. Now, depending on which country you're in, as I mentioned, they'll be written with the electrons on the left-hand side or the right-hand side with the associated voltage value. Whatever way you, you decide to write it for write it as, always make sure that you flip the sign accordingly. Uh, don't, don't start flipping the reaction and you don't update your value because you, it'll mess up your calculations. And finally, we have our free energy of the system equation. Delta G equals negative N times F times E system where E system is your E anodic and E cathodic. Now, I've told you that E anodic is your anode, or you know, you could connect that dot there. That is where you, that is the part of oxidation, that's where you lose electrons. And the things that lose electrons are the metal. So therefore, you could say that E anodic is associated to the left-hand side to your corrosion cell. And E cathodic is the part that accepts the electrons. So you could associate it as E cathodic on the right-hand side. And of course, keep in mind that you can't transfer electrons via water. So I'll explain what exactly happens in the environment side here. But just know that that's where your E cathodic will be pulled from. Once you have all your values, you find the number of electrons uh, taking place in the reaction. Uh, you use Faraday's constant, you plug it in, and you should get a positive or negative delta G value. If it's a negative delta G value, you'll probably and most likely have corrosion. If you have a positive, I should have said negative. I think I said positive. It's negative. But if you have a positive delta G value, um, you'll be safe. Uh, you most likely won't have corrosion happening, but of course, this can't be your only way of knowing. You have to conduct additional tests to make sure that it's not happening and, you know, tests that are done in the laboratory and all that good stuff. That is it for this lecture. If you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments. If there's anything I should have mentioned or maybe you have any input, let me know. Uh, I'll leave a pinned comment in the comment section or maybe I'll update the description if I forgot to mention something. But that is it for today. Thank you for watching and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.